The tough thing is that you know most businesses are assessed on their trailing 12 month performance against prior 12 months. There is a real community which is engaging with the product, then you know my view is these are bargain. These are bargain deals that traditional PE would be dying for if they knew about it. So we are a an ecosystem and a network that they can tap into. So you get the best of both worlds, the deals that come from the sellers directly as well as the deals that come from the brokers. So on today's episode, I'm speaking with the CEO of Flipper.com. We talk about M&A, exits, multiples, deal flow, all the shebang about buying and selling businesses through marketplaces or brokers. It's a great episode. You do not want to miss it. Do stay tuned. Hello, 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 2Xers. Welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast. I'm your host, Kune Campbell. The 2X e-commerce, as you know, is dedicated to digital commerce insights for retail and e-commerce teams. Each week on this podcast, we interview either a founder at a way and test and see if it works over the next 30 days. If it works, tell me what your growth stories. If it doesn't, move on, iterate, learn fast, fail fast, move on for success. We want you to grow your conversions, your average order value. We want to build your retention efforts, your audience size, and eventually your gross merchant value or sales. We are here to help you sell more sustainably on 2X e-commerce. On today's episode, um, I interviewed Blake Hodgkinson, who is the CEO of not founder, but the CEO of Flipper.com. Flipper was or has been one of those pillar sites, along with the likes of Empire, you know, Flippers. They're the pioneers in um, in e-commerce or in digital M&A, in the, in the digital M&A space. They're, they're pioneers. Um, they're, they're over a decade old, um, and I think it's owned by the same chap who owns 99designs. Um, they're the world's largest, according to them, marketplace to buy and sell online businesses. Blake leads the team as they build out product empowering exits and ownership for business owners and entrepreneurs globally. Prior to, to running Flipper, Blake has held leadership software called Zero. Um so on, on this episode, um, I, I sort of grounded this episode on um, on a quote from my co-founder of at Octalian Capital Partners, Io, who often remarks that M&A, it's merger and acquisitions for those of you who um, are not aware, is the final frontier in business mastery. And the, the reason why, you know, he says that and, you know, we align with that at OCP is... Um, just study any any successful business and you'd see one of the growth strategies, sometimes even a protection strategy, is to acquire um, businesses. It's Sometimes it's just faster, right? So you can acquire a target, say you have 500,000 active users or customers rather, and you acquire another you know, business that has a hundred thousand active users and you've increased your, your, you've, you've increased your user base or customer base by 20%. That's just an example. So Blake in, in this episode, just take any flipper is both, um, a, a marketplace platform as well as, um, as, as well as has, ha, um, as well as has a brokerage, um, in it. So you could actually, you know, interact with, um, with staff there, um, with sales staff that would help you, you know, find the deals you're looking for. Well, besides that, I really quiz him on multiples. Um, I quiz him on intangible value, particularly for, you know, brands that have built communities and, um, a lot of brand equity, you know, why the standard 4X, you know, 4X SD or 4X net profit actually matters for, um, for, for for brands um for for really brand driven businesses and we talk about deal flow we talked about um you know geo so the injury cases of um buying a business that does not have um 3pl um overseas cross border how do you manage that and he gave really really interesting examples and um answers to that um and then we talked about um just 
general tips on how to prepare your business, um, you know, for, for an exit and what the next 12 months will look like in the M and A space. Um, I, 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 I find that I'm, I'm blessed. I feel blessed, um, given the fact that I've learned so much in, in the M and A space, still a lot, a ton to learn in, in the past year with, um, the founding of Octillion Capital Partners. We, I will give you an update on, um, on our acquisition, um, it is going to happen fairly soon. Um, I would make announcements, you know, about it when when it happens on the podcast. You guys will be the first to, to hear. Um, but besides that, great, great, great episode. Um, he's he's quite versed, um, you know, quite a versatile CEO. Uh, really, 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 really good convo um, with Blake. So yeah, thanks for the listen, and let me know what you think. Leave us reviews. Remember on um, social platforms and enjoy. Hey, Blake, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast. Hey, Kunlai, thanks for having me. Fantastic. Um, let me, wh- where do I start from? I'm like very, very looking forward to, to this. Um, very excited to, to, about this, 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 this episode um, because, you know, Flipper goes way back, right? Um, and we use Flipper in Octillion Capital Partners um, and you're very data- um, you know, driven, which is, which is why I like it. But before I just go on all that, <laughs> before I just try and try, you know, um, just, just go off tangent, I'd like to know your backstory. Where did it all start? Have you been entrepreneurial as it, were you tr- entrepreneurial as a kid? Um, and yeah, I just like to know your, your background. I don't think I was entrepreneurial as a kid. I mean, I had a, a real, um, desire to work and work hard but probably no no different to any other you know 15 or 16 year old here in Australia looking to make their first paycheck or get their first paycheck mm. i think i developed a real passion for entrepreneurship after relocating from australia to san francisco and so i spent okay. 6 years in san francisco and it gave me a real sense of understanding for um well obviously startups um secondly for the hustle and mm. the thrill of the chase, the idea that something very small can become very big, not only through obviously having a very good idea, um, but through amassing great talent around you and, and slogging at it for long enough until mm. you find a pathway to obviously MVP and then scale. So I, I got a great deal of um, inspiration from my time in San Francisco and haven't stopped since then. Interesting. So you're in Melbourne, um, Australia now. You did you did you grow up in Melbourne yourself? Yeah, grew up in Melbourne, moved to Tokyo, came back to Australia, moved to San Francisco after the BBC acquired a travel publish, publisher called Lonely Planet. Okay. And so I was seconded um, to the US representing the Lonely Planet business development team. Spent six okay. years in the US both Lonely Planet, the BBC, and then for a startup, um, 2008, so just prior to the GFC, um, worked for a startup there. We raised $13 million, essentially off a piece of paper, to build a new age trip planner. And believe it or not, we raised from um, X Lehman Brothers Capital, which was rebranded <laughs> shortly after the GFC, to Tanaya Capital. Wow. Okay. Incredible, incredible, and 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 then you, so did you work in in the startup in in in, in B, for, for BBC over um, the, the the entire six years in in San Francisco, or is that where you sort of originated the you know what ideated you know Flipper dot com? Yeah, so I, I consider myself entrepreneurial, but just to be clear, I'm not the founder of Flipper. I've been running Flipper now for nearly four years, but interestingly okay. enough. I did have a, um, I relocated back to Australia and I started a, what began as a daily email magazine, uh, similar to Daily Candy and Thrill List and Urban Daddy. It was a lifestyle publication. Mm -hmm. From that spawned a marketplace to buy and sell specialty food, a little bit like Etsy, but specifically Mm -hmm. for specialty food. And I tried to sell that on Flipper. So I'm a customer and a user of the Flipper product. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, uh, I worked for Zero Cloud Accounting Software, mm-hmm. then ran 
Australia's fastest growing e-commerce business, which was an online travel agency called Luxury Escapes. Mm -hmm. At that point, having done those things, having experienced different business models across different industries, I was recruited to run Flipper. So interesting journey and now find myself running, obviously, a global marketplace to buy and sell online businesses. Okay, makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. And and the founder of of, of Flipper, I I remember he also founded um, what's this um, ninety nine designs? Is, is it Matt? Yeah, Rick that's Kelsey? right. Is he still is he still active in in Flipper or? Um, yeah, he is. He's on the board. Okay. He's uh, the you know alongside the other co founder Mark Harbottle, who's based here in Australia. Matt's based in North America, North America. They're the single largest shareholders. Uh, they sit on the board. They're very close advisors to mine. They're marketplace mm-hmm. experts in their blood. And as you said, um, 99 Designs as well. What was really interesting about that story and the lesson for entrepreneurs is you never quite know where a great idea comes from, right? Because yeah. they had a, uh, a platform and a community called SitePoint. And SitePoint spawned two businesses. The first one was 99 Designs where people were trading design. And the second one was Flipper, where people were trading templates, source code, blogs, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So they spun those two businesses out as standalone marketplaces about six years into SitePoint's journey. And Flipper's Mm -hmm. now been around for 13 years. Yeah, yeah. I remember because um, I, I, you know, I'd used um, 99 designs um, to ideate, you know, a few, um, you know, um, products. We, we just the the brand identity at the time, you know, and it was fascinating. Like you could get, sort of, you know, um, a so such diverse, um, you know, pitches, design pitches, ready made design pitches, and then you choose one, and yeah, it was quite, quite, quite good, quite good. Yes. Yeah, okay, super so. Good Interesting. Very, 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 very interesting. And, and so you're at Flipper now. now. What does the, what your, your CEO of Flipper, what does running Flipper look like on a day-to-day basis? Um, you know, how many people are we talking about the back end? Um, it's a very digital business, as, as you can imagine. It's a marketplace. Yep. So there's, there's economies of scale. Um, so, so what is it, what, what's your day-to-day? Um, as a Time zones are a nightmare. Um, that's the first thing I would say. Um yeah, so day-to-day is building the team and we're building a product and engineering function here in Melbourne and a sales function in Austin, Texas. So just to give you some context around that, product and engineering has always been born and bred in Melbourne, Australia for Flipper, which gives hopefully some people confidence that you can actually build a product-led organisation from anywhere in the world and, and mm-hmm. still acquire a global customer base. But interestingly enough, of course, you know, as the average transaction value increases on Flipper. People need not only the the efficiency of the platform, but some advisory to go with that. Yeah. And so we've cards. started to add expertise in our Austin office and built a sales function there. So a lot of my day-to-day relates to um, working with the product and engineering function to scope out our next big rock initiatives. And we've got mm-hmm. some real innovations. I'm happy to talk about a few of those today coming down the pipe. Um, and then separately helping that sales team be more efficient in their approach. And that's mm-hmm. not only through the technologies, but also our training that we, mm-hmm. we conduct almost daily to ensure that they're, they're experts in multiple business models. Because, of course, on Flipper, what's really unique about it is you've got small business owners and entrepreneurs, startups from all walks of life, be it e-com, of course, which you know we can talk about today, but also SaaS and iOS and Android apps and Uh, content sites and things like that. So the day-to-day is really about product development Mm -hmm. and sales efficiency. And uh, it it very much um, is is the lifeblood of our organisation. Can we build a great platform which helps deals get done easier for both parties? Mm -hmm. And can we provide the advisory that they need to do those deals? Mm And so, 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 in regards to deals, how many deals are currently listed on on Flipper um, on an average? Um, how many deals typically get listed um, when you know when people are browsing through? So, there's probably about six thousand live listings at any given time. Mm-hmm. We also have a different measure for that, which is kind of marketplace value, so the value of the assets. Right. To give you some sense of that, we just had a record $130 million in marketplace value added in June, so not mm. quite the end of the month. And 
that's indicative of, interestingly enough, it's not necessarily that we're getting more assets list. It's that the average value of the asset has increased over time. And that's as, frankly, as more buyers come to the platform with different needs and, and bigger budgets and bigger wallets. That's is, one way is, to think about it. Is that due to SDE or multiples? So we do it on a multiple of SDE for the main street. So that's 500K, sub 500K revenue mm -hmm. to 2 mil annual revenue. Mm -hmm. And for the lower middle market, you do it on a net profit multiple mm -hmm. and lower middle market being 2 mil annual rev to 50 mil annual rev. Mm -hmm. So we have two, two slightly different valuation approaches. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, from a multiple standpoint, um, you have, you know, websites, apps, domains, mm -hmm. e-commerce, content sites, um, SaaS businesses, and even service businesses, apparently, and Amazon AdSense businesses. How do multiples vary from, um, from, from essentially sector? These are not even verticals. These, these are, yeah. you know, key different business types, really. So from sector to sector. Particularly e-commerce content versus um, um, SaaS, if we were to just yeah. whittle it down into those three categories. Yeah, so, so to simplify it, typically a e-com business doesn't have the margin or margins of a content or SaaS business. Mm -hmm. So what that means is typically you're getting sub one times revenue multiples sub one times revenue multiples. Yeah. <laughs> you probably need to say it again. Sometimes sub one times revenue multiples. Yep. But profit multiples, um, I'm looking at a few examples here just based on my index. Uh, deal done yesterday, $2.5 million e-commerce business at 3.62 profit multiple, right? Yeah. So you tend to be looking at two to four times and it's all dependent well, on multiple factors, but one of the biggest factors is obviously margin, right? So how, how efficient is the business that's selling through its product? And that's a lower multiple than what you're going to get for a really high, uh, high caliber app content site or SaaS business. If I look at my index now, 5.45 times profit for apps. And I'm seeing at the top end, this is not for all assets, of course. At the top end, I'm seeing 7.63 times okay. for a content site. Now, the I'm, reason I'm guessing, I'm guessing that retention rates are quite high. And, and so yeah. with, with better yeah. re retain, CLV, CRV, uh, you're yeah. going to command more, more multiples. It's just more guaranteed money, <laughs> future free money. Users, free users too, right? Google's providing the users based on keyword search. So right. um, you don't have to spend to acquire. And so, you know, Google and Facebook are making it, well, and arguably with a recession, which we may be going into, arguably you're going to get some better ad rates. But, but certainly... The cost of advertising, given the competitive space, the competitive nature of the e-com space has become more and more expensive. And so therefore your margins get eaten into. And as a result, um, the profitability that you report is not as high and, and then you get acquired on a profit margin. Whereas a content website typically um, is a more passive asset. So your your, your COGS line is, is less, less high um, mm -hmm. and therefore you get a better margin. Interesting. Super, super interesting. Okay. Um, what about the kinds of acquirers? Um, m a the m a space has argue, arguably become very, very busy, in, particularly yeah. in e-commerce. I really want to just jump into the into e-commerce. Um, yep. You have aggregators. Um, you have boutique, um, you know, acquirers that build in um, just a portfolio, um, you know, a decent portfolio of... Um, of of companies similar to what we're doing at Toptelian. And then you have just entrepreneurs, you know, trying to dip in their, 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 their hands in just due to the mm. fact that, um, um, you know, there, there's so much um, information out there. And then you have the online courses, you know, <laughs> just, you know, churning out, you know, so, so-called students who, who are looking at deals. 
Yes. Um, how, from your perspective, th- that's my definition. How would you define, um, you know, categories from a flipper viewpoint of, um, yeah. you know, buyers that um, regular your your um, your listings? Yeah, I th- I th- look, I think you're right. So, side hustlers, entrepreneurs, companies, and companies can be broken down into you know small organisations that are looking to acquire assets, all the way through to institutional investors. So. Mm. Side hustlers, entrepreneurs, and companies, they're the three buyer types. Their budgets differ substantially. Actually, it's rare that the two roads meet. And and you've got this weird um, gap in the market. If anyone can afford them, you get really good deals, 200 to 300K. And the reason being is (laughs) they're too small for companies and they're too big for individuals, typically. Mm. So if any uh, high net worth out there is looking to get good deals, start aggregating um, two to two to three year old e-commerce assets that are that are trading on a two times multiple being sold for two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars. Two times multiple of their SDE profit or SDE, yes, okay. SDE, yeah. yeah. So they're the company buyers now. Of course, as I just alluded to. Um, Never the two roads shall meet. Company buyers are a lot bigger. In fact, when we look at our data, their average, their average budget is eight million. So eight million, but not to do a single deal, right? Most company buyers aren't buying one business. Their average budget is eight mil. Now, of course, you've got some mega buyers. You've talked about the aggregators and there's PE, and they might be looking at more lower middle markets, so annualized rev of of two to 50 mil, Mm -hmm. but just to be clear on average, on average deal, preferred deal size is 1.6 million for a company buy. Mm. Averages are a bit, a little bit misleading for obvious reasons, but 1.6 mil is the average. Meaning that they're, they're, they're looking to purchase about five, five or so, you know, um, businesses with their 8 million. Correct. Okay. Now, a side hustler um, is a fun little buyer type. Um, there's lots of them, but to some extent, they're going to stimulate and grow the e-commerce industry around us because they typically have a day job. They are uh, they have expertise, and what they do is on the side, they might go and acquire a business for fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and they scale that. They scale that into the business that you know, the next step up, the entrepreneurs are even above and beyond that, the company buyers want to acquire. So I think it's still early days. You're seeing great maturation of e-commerce businesses. And as a result, the institutional buyers will have a lot of fodder in years to come. Mm, mm, mm. We're no doubt um, going through very challenging times economically. Um, We're seeing um, just weak demand in general. Um, and some people think we've not hit rock bottom yet. Um, is this reflective in acquisition activity on Flipper at the moment? Um, do you think in the next 12 to 18 months that, you know, there'll be more deals to be had due to the fact that, you know, over the last 12 months, um, you know, um, general revenue and SD just profits and SDE would have been, mm. you know, suppressed, meaning that um, they're trading 12 months, you know, performance will, yep. you know, yield lower EV, you know, enterprise value. What, what, what's your take on, on that? So the tough thing is that, you know, most businesses are assessed on their trailing 12-month performance against prior 12 months. And so as a result, business owners may find that on paper, their businesses don't look as good. Kind of point one, if you like. But we have not seen the demand side dry up. There's a lot of dry powder, in fact, that is looking to acquire good quality businesses. Now, remember, this is an asset class that is currently underappreciated and undervalued. So we just talked before about a $2.5 million asset, which was acquired for 3.62 times SDE and 0.73 revenue. It's a high quality asset. Mm -hmm. It's growing. 
in tunic economics are strong, that is a damn good deal. Now you can't you can't compare that to the public market sell-off because you're just dealing with completely different valuation um, multiples and and ways of valuing businesses. These are small businesses that are still undervalued and underappreciated, and and smart buyers know that. So I don't think we we see less intent from the buying community. One thing that may happen is that savvy buyers use um, the public market sell-off and or the challenging economic times to negotiate, not deservedly, but use it as a negotiation ploy. We haven't seen it yet, but my general sentiment is that as long as company buyers continue to enter the space with dry powder, there's deals to be done. Company buyers being PE firms? PE firms, um, successful entrepreneurs with big businesses who are you know, buying companies to scale and get grow, mm-hmm. growth. Um, and you know, don't underestimate how many savvy entrepreneurs, e-commerce operators there are right now thinking about growth through acquisition oh, versus versus you know marketing buying. yeah exactly slow yeah because my my partner i often remarks that you know m a is the final frontier in in business you know just um it's it's just for me it's like that black belt you know you, you, you can know marketing you can know sales you know um you could be great at product but every yeah. great company just has an m a you know um strategy to what for yeah. expansion essentially it's, yeah. it's just gaining territory really yeah and if you can do that on a good multiple mm-hmm. where you're dealing with a business with a high average order value so you've got good unit economics um good quality supplier agreements in place um and and most importantly a brand right a brand it's not a fly-by-night operation that is scaled through very heavy investment on Facebook. There is a real community which is engaging with the product. Then, you know, my view is these are bargain. These are bargain deals that traditional PE would be dying for if they knew about it. Yep. And speaking to the point of you know, um, you know, brands. Um, there's, this is, there's another, so are you, what are your thoughts on the fact that yes, you know, net profits and, you know, SDE, depending on what, you know, what parts of the market are a good indicator of multiples, but that community, how do you value a brand? How do you value the community? How do you, you know, that's a, an intangible asset, but what's worth an, an awful amount which in many cases, if it's been painstakingly built, does not reflect in the net profit or, you know, SDE. How, how do you serve, do you see deals like that on Flipper? And, and All how, the time, how you I agree deals? with you. It's, it's an intangible and that's not how the business is being valued. So the business owner is, is um, leaving money on the table because a savvy buyer will talk about your trailing 12-month performance Talk about the fact that, yep, it's wonderful that you've built a community, but the reality is that's not um, that's not a traditional way to value a business, is it? You know, the size mm. of a community. They know, they know just as well as you and I do, that they're paying for performance, but they're buying for opportunity. I love that. And so we see multiple businesses list on Flipper that do a really good job of stating their financial and operational metrics, including the size of their community and the engaged nature of the community. But buyers discounted it. Um, I'm not saying they reduce the price as a result of it. I'm just saying discounted as a, as a means to not reflect it in the actual final sale price. Yeah. But they know how valuable it is and they harness that post-acquisition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I often see this that for strategic investors, you know, sorry, um, for strategic acquisitions, you know, by um, just conglomerates, they... They, they just don't look at SDE or profit because they know if they don't snap up that, you know, target another, you know, company will, and they just give them multiples of revenue and, you know, they, mm-hmm. they just see crazy 
you know, exits, you know, off the back of it, yeah. you know, case in, in mind, you know, Dollar Shave Club. Yeah, Dollar Shave Club. And that's right. It tends to happen at the um, CPG, at the traditional M&A level, mm. doesn't it? I mean, I think mm. small business owners, unfortunately, don't, don't see as crazy multiples because even though they might have a community of 100,000 or 200,000, um, you know, buyers don't, don't value that in the same way that a Gillette will, a Dollar Shave Club community of tens of millions of people. Super interesting. I want to talk or speak to the case of, you know, cross-border M&A um, over the last decade um, with, with platforms such as yours, um, it's not surprising you, you do not seeing um, you know UK entrepreneurs buying Amazon businesses in in the US or even Australia. Um, my question is, how sustainable is is that over time? Particularly from the point of view of you know, most of these businesses are 3PL. If you buy an Amazon FBA business, mm -hmm. um, all of the, you know, heavy lifting in terms of the last mile delivery storage and last mile delivery is handled by Amazon. So you don't need to have personnel on ground. You know, you're essentially yep. a marketing and a sourcing company, you know, product, product, yes. you know, led company. But for a direct to consumer business, it's, 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 it's very different sometimes, you know, a lot of D2C businesses, you know, have, um, you know, warehouses with staff in it. Yeah. But what are your thoughts on on how you know to you know how this all plays out, particularly for you know UK entrepreneurs looking to to buy in the US? Do you move to the US or get a competent CEO in the US to to to, to manage or COO there to to manage operations? How, what, what have you seen, and do you have any stories to to speak to that? Yeah, I mean a few. I mean what you'll tend to see is that they'll retain the owner and operational teams and you see a lot of those deals and they're structured as you know what what you would understand in traditional m a land as an earn out what some people now call a stability payment <laughs> and so what they'll do is you know they'll incentivize the management teams to stay on board for a 24 to 36 months and they'll tie those incentives back to the ongoing performance or growth of the asset over a 36 month window. So as they've got some assurance that what they're buying is a, a good cash flow generating asset where the risk of deploying a new team is minimized by keeping on the existing. That's the most common. I have, you know, I, I don't think it's that sensible a strategy to think that you can acquire a business and then deploy a management team fast enough um, and well enough that you can stabilise the patient. Mm. So, again, what happens to the staff on ground? Say you want to acquire, you know, a business that um, sells furniture. You know, yep. um, in Australia, fantastic numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but even if you can communicate, you know, in the time zone of the, your suppliers or what have you, you still need to move products. Your, your warehouse needs to be efficient. So, so does yep. that mean that over the earnout period, um, you know, the the ex founder is putting together a competent team and a leader replacement to to, to manage operations on there? And these these would be obviously the big you know bigger deals, you know in context yep. uh, i guess there'll be yep. the five million plus deals yep. um so that um and then they set a reporting cadence so that there's smooth operations between you know where you are and you know their operations out there just wants you to sort of paint me a picture and mm. what it looked like post yes we see a lot of that i mean we've seen we've seen israeli based private equity by mm. australian based an australian based toy retailer we've seen um us based high net worths um, by Italian based e-commerce. Mm. And I think each deal is a little bit different, but yeah, as you said, I mean, the expectation is that there is a, a way of working. It's 
typically checklist based. There's a operational playbook, and that's probably a a smart piece of advice for prospective sellers. So business owners who are considering a sale, you want to have everything documented. So as there is a SOP or, or operating standard operating procedure which governs the way that everything works. And yeah, what we what we tend to find, although you know, admittedly it's anecdotal, we candidly and a bit embarrassingly, we don't spend that much time with our buyers post sale. Um, we certainly should. But anecdotally, when we speak to them, yeah, they're assembling teams around the existing operational teams so as to have a safe landing. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. Because um, one of the things we're doing at Telian is um, we, we are getting the founder to be shadowed by a chief operating officer, or, you know, operational yeah. director. So there's that brain dump, you know, over the, the next six to 12 months while they're, they're earning out. Um, yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Most of the time, someone just to add to that, I mean, most yeah. of the operational teams, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they're not, they're not shareholders. They're not equity holders in the business. Yeah. So they, they want to keep their jobs. They want to be retained. So once the manager has um, worked out their earn out period or achieved that stability payment, um, you know, we often see that GMs are placed and CEOs are placed or COOs are placed into those businesses, but the core teams are retained. Yeah. And a lot of the time due diligence not only comes down to the, the, the financials for obvious reasons and the metrics governing those financials, but, but it comes down to who are the key components, who are your key men on the ground, key men or women, I should say, on the ground that drive the assets performance. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Makes sense. It's the people, really. It's you know, it's, it's really that found foundational, you know, bit leadership, and then you know the people around around that. Cool, cool, cool. Um, before I let you go, uh, I wanted to just you to give us some um just killer tips on finding deals on Flipper. You know, tips yep. you haven't said anywhere else. You know, first. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the first yeah. thing is we we have off-market and private deals, okay? Mm-hmm. So what you see on Flipper is not actually what is for sale. It's a big part of it, of course. And so the best way to find out about those private deals is to set up a buyer profile, including your bio. So the buyer profile enables you to set a budget, um, preferred deal size, obviously business model, category, location, uh, those types of things, whether it's subject, it's likely to be a deal subject to financing or not. Accordingly, what we do is then, you know, alert you of relevant deals both on and off market. The second biggest tip is to simply sign up for our daily, weekly, or monthly email. It's free. All of you know, Flipper doesn't have a buyer subscription. It's a free service. You can sign up to as many things as you want. People love that email. It's a curated email. So our our advisors pick the deals by business model that they want to showcase. You don't have to come back to the platform ever. Just get that email, wait for something to hit your inbox that makes sense to you. Um, it's not necessarily always the biggest deals, but it's the deals that make the most sense for the biggest number of email subscribers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then tap into our relationship managers. So they can hunt for you. They are paid to be your business development workforce. They will go and find deals relevant for you. Mm-hmm. We had we had a mandate on our platform a couple of months ago for a, a, a buyer who had $50 million to spend. Average preferred deal size was 8 to $12 million, and we've just found him an $11.5 million deal using one of our relationship managers. So, yes, we're a technology platform first and foremost, Um, unlike most others, which are brokers, brokers use our platform. So we are an ecosystem and a network that they can tap into. So you get the best of both worlds, the deals that come from the sellers directly, as well as the deals that come from the brokers. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Blake, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the 2X e-commerce podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Brilliant.
Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Before I let you go, um, for those of you who want to, you know, check out Flipper, it's flipper.com. Um, but Blake, are you active yourself on on social media? Do you do you are you a LinkedIn poster? Do you do you, do you tweet a lot? Um, if if yes, um, you know what what platforms are you most active on? Yeah, most active on LinkedIn. I just find that the conversations better uh, yeah. personally. You can get me on Twitter at Blake now. Um, from time to time, I'll share deals and tips and those types of things. Otherwise, if you want to connect directly, I'd love to chat to any of your audience and listenership at uh, on my LinkedIn, LinkedIn. account. Just call me at Blake Hutchison. No, absolutely pleasure, mate. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.